So I want you to be able to hold on to your blue book and your green books. So she really fucking thought this was real. Mm -hmm. So we're all fucked right now. <laughs> Yeah, you really helped a lot. Thank you for that. <laughs> you know, we gotta help each other out. I'm Seriously. Gonna fail, I'm gonna help you. <laughs> How'd you pull that off though? She just let you like take it and next one you're like, oh, you can't make it. Mm -hmm. I did that for, um, uh, what's it called? Systemic, the second one. And it's the same. <laughs> and that's how I got like a 96. <laughs> Uh, you gotta finesse. I'm like, I'm wanting to do that. It gotta be good with it, though. I'm gonna have a solid. Yeah, solid. How did that happen? Mm -hmm. I couldn't go from like a three to like an eight point three. I don't know that. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not that. More? Are you serious? Two more. Okay, this, I'm, pr I'm practicing for Monday.
called snipping tool and enlargement. That's how I got this document. Okay. So we got RNA polymerase is enhanced to bind to here. So we have our little activator is made. That's what's showing here. Activator is made and it's inactive until an inducer binds it. Now it's an active activator. It's going to bind to the R and the RNA polymerase is going to get enhanced to bind. That's positive control. Okay. So the other thing that can happen with this activator is that you could have a repressor bind it and then it falls off. It becomes inactive. So we have an active that it normally binds without something binding it, and then as soon as something binds it, it comes off, a repressor. So you could have used both, where you have an activator that maybe it doesn't have the inducer present. And if the inducer isn't present or a molecule isn't present, and that would be like the CRP, cyclic AMP that we gave, that you had to have CRP and cyclic AMP present to bind upstream with the lac operon in order for it to run. And that is an activator system, and that gene can be turned off because you don't have that effector molecule binding the activator to help it bind upstream. So maybe you talked about that because that's directly related to the CRP, the lactose operon that we talked about on, on Monday. Or maybe you remembered that you could have a repressor that binds to the activator and when it binds to the activator, it comes off and then you have this really poor consensus sequence for RNA polymerase. RNA polymerase isn't gonna bind there without the activator and so in an activator system, this one gene is turned off. So you could have given either of those answers, okay? All right, cool. And then you could look at it the other way. We could talk about how is the gene turned um, in a repressor system, how is it turned on in a repressor system? You can ask as you're studying for this exam on Monday with friends, you could ask each other all of the different questions that get you into each of the different boxes of this grid. But we talked about how you can have positive control, and you can have negative control, and with both positive and negative control, you can have both induction and repression of your gene. Okay? So that little quiz question was a good kind of review I'm gonna get one. Uh, for all of this. Help us remind ourselves those things. Now we left off um, talking about the CRP and catabolite repression. And catabolite repression is an example of a global regulatory system. So let me get my notes open. You guys already have yours. Yeah? Yeah, um, Are you gonna put the study guide up? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I gotta see how far we get today. Okay. Okay. So um, so I this is where we left off, and of course I wasted it's always my favorite when students come up after class and ask to borrow my pen, and I go, what have you been using? Uh, lecture long. Um, and here I am, a professor, looking for paper. There we go. Um, Okay, I got two pieces. I got, I'm up to two pieces of paper up here that I can muster together. So let's we'll just go with it. And Do you need blank paper? I might need some blank paper okay. in a little bit. Four times. Four times. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Sorry, you, you were asking, and I was thinking I was going to be able to find my own paper. I did find. Did I find? Okay. I'm up to three pieces of paper. Okay. Okay. So. Um, so let's talk about global regulators and regulons. We mentioned regulons, but I was thinking about it. I don't think we actually didn't. Okay, so I don't think that um, we defined regulons, although we got a picture of them, right? Did we write anything down about a regulon? No. no. So it's time. It's time. So this is regulons. Okay, a regulon or regulons are regulators that uh, can function in trans. And you know what that means, right, from 184? In trans, okay? So across the chromosome. 
all right? They can function in trans as well as cis, but it's usually in trans, okay? And bind to multiple um, genes, okay? And these guys can both turn on <coughs> as well as turn off genes, okay? So regulons are regulators that can function in trans across the chromosome and bind to multiple genes. And they're gonna bind somewhere in the promoter region. Upstream of the promoter if they're an activator, downstream of the promoter if they're a repressor. Bind to the operator region. And they can turn genes on and they can turn genes off and they can do it at the same time. So I'm gonna give you some examples to support our definition here in a second. But it could turn, okay, so for instance, salmonella has a lot, like a lot of different bacteria, like to live in a couple different places. So salmonella can live inside of our intestines and it can also live inside of our macrophages, which are one of the main cells of our immune system. And I think I've mentioned that concept about salmonella before, maybe. So it actually has regulators that tell it we're outside of the macrophage in the intestine, and then it has sensors that tell it, oh, we're inside the macrophage. You need to turn these genes on that enable us to live inside of this very hostile cell. So pretty clever. So you have, and, and also says, okay, we're out, we're no longer in this hostile, we're in a different hostile environment. So these things, so it turns off sets of genes that it doesn't need anymore and turns on sets of genes that it does need and it has to do it with the same signal, we're inside the cell now, okay? It does the same thing, it lives inside of epithelial cells that line our intestine, it gets inside of those epithelial cells. That's a great place to be, right? Because it's away from the immune response, it's nice and safe but it has specialized genes, type three secretion, and an effector molecule that goes through type three secretion that induces the epithelial cell to ruffle. It just goes, whoa, what's happening? And salmonella slips inside that epithelial cell and then it closes up, the eukaryotic cell closes up and salmonella is happily inside of our epithelial cells that line our intestine. Here, meanwhile, you're just vomiting and have diarrhea. You had no idea. It was so cool what was going on. <laughs> so um, anyway, it has specialized genes that turn on that type 3 secretion and the, the genes for those effector molecules to go that are going into the epithelial cell. But once it's inside the epithelial cell, it doesn't need that, those 60 genes for that type 3 secretion system anymore, right? So it turns off all those and turns on the other ones that it needs for living inside of the cell. Kind of cool, huh? So in this way, it has multiple regulons that enable it to survive in different types of environments. So these regulons are, are really um, very versatile and uh, in many, many different systems. So I'm gonna give you some examples, okay? So uh, the first example I gave you uh, is catabolite repression. Okay, so we already learned about catabolite repression, so you can go back into your notes for that. Another example, so that's example one. Another example is uh, how they're involved in pathogenesis. You know, pathogenesis is how organisms cause disease, pathogenesis, and you can learn all about it in a 15-week class offered next fall, Pathogenic Bacteriology Bio 144. Uh, salmonella is the one we were talking about. And salmonella is able, uh, we said, invades epithelial cells. And these are gonna be intestinal, just so we're in the right place in the body, lots of epithelial cells in our body, epithelial cells. And it uh, has a regulon that is going to turn uh, genes on for invasion. Okay, and, um, and then it turns them off, these off, 
for invasion once it's inside. Okay, and so it's gonna need a lot of genes. So that Regulon works, right, in a lot of different places. And the one thing that I've shown you here is that usually these Regulons are regulators for whole sets of genes that are for one purpose, okay? And I'm gonna show you some more examples. So multiple genes involved in epithelial cell invasion, for instance. Multiple sets of genes involved in, well, let's tell you about SIR, the SIR gene. It's found in Pyrococcus furiosus, okay? So can you, you can't read this, I'm hearing a tone across the room. Involved in pathogenesis, that's an H, pathogen, pathogenesis, salmonella invades intestinal epithelial cells, and it has a regulon that turns gene on for invasion and turns other genes off for invasion once inside. And this is an <coughs> S, which is relevant, genes, plural, because we're talking about regulons, okay? And it does the same for macrophage invasion and survival, yeah. So you're saying that it has certain genes to like try and sell, turn off, try and invade, and then once those inside, they'll turn those off, and turn into a whole other set of genes? That enable it to survive inside of that space. Right? Pretty cool, nice. Is there like a number on average of genes that these can um, affect? Would it be like hundreds or? or? I'm gonna tell you one that uh, affects 53 genes right now. You ready? So yeah, many, many, many. Okay, so the third example I'm gonna tell you is an archaea. So I like this because it's a little bit of a review for Monday, right? So we've got archaea, and you know about archaea. And this archaea is Pyrococcus furiosus. Ooh. Where do you think this lives? Hot? Cold, salty, humid, stinking hot, stinking hot. This thing uh, was found in ocean thermal vents off the coast of Italy. Okay, so it's an archaea. Off the coast of Italy, the boot, uh, in a ocean thermal vent. Okay, so we got, uh, Woody, it, it, it likes to hang out at 100 degrees C, so what kind of organism does that make it? Extreme. An extremophile, more specifically. Oh, hypo, hyperthermophile. Hyperthermophile, excellent. Okay, so it's a hyperthermophile. And it turns out this organism can uh, grow using uh, fermentation. And it can also, uh, in, in doing fermentation, it releases hydrogen, okay? And it can also grow using anaerobic respiration. Is that what hyperthermophiles are? Or what the RGB is? I'm talking about pyrococcus furiosus. I'm giving you a little background on this guy, okay? Does that help answer? Yeah. Okay. So this hyperthermophile pyrococcus furiosus found it off the coast of Italy when it can grow using fermentation, releasing hydrogen, or it can grow using anaerobic respiration, okay? And when it does that, it utilizes sulfur, elemental sulfur, okay? And releases hydrogen sulfide. What kind of organism is this? Thermo hyperthermophile, archaea. Categorize it in its metabolism with the person next to you because you prepared so nicely. If you go for your mini quiz, you should be ready to answer this one. Chemolithic growth. What organism is this? 
this one is toxic. Oh, and by the way, oxygen is toxic to this thing. Mm. Does that help? So it's the, uh, what, which one is it? Um, It'd be down at the bottom. It was the one that had like the pink layer and then a little bit right here, right? Or no? Or no. is it just the anaerobic? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, it'd be like all throughout, I'm guessing. No. This, she said it's anaerobic. Okay, so that's when you're going to want to look at that sheet that's up on canvas, okay? So we know that it undergoes anaerobic respiration. So that knocks out the aerobes. It's not that. I said oxygen is toxic to it, so it's not a facultative anaerobe. So that leaves two categories. One of those categories is fermentation only. What's that? Aerotolerant, so it's not that. It was fermentation and anaerobic respiration. What is it? Obligate and anaerobe. All right, so it's an obligate anaerobe. Which type of uh, respiration and fermentation, which are they going to get the most ATP from? Fermentation or anaerobic respiration? Fermentation. Oh, yep, God. you can get plenty of ATP with anaerobic respiration. Fermentation, how many do you get? Two. 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 Rock. See, you're ready. Some of you are going over the I better study. <laughs> good. It's a good wake up. Okay, so. All right, so it's got, so we've explained, I've given you some background to this very cool organism. And there was a really nice publication in Molecular Microbiology about nine years ago, talking about this transcriptional activator and repressor that controls hydrogen and elemental sulfur metabolism in Pyrococcus furiosus, okay? So this is what I'm telling you about. So we've got this archaea, that has a regulator that is both a transcriptional activator and a transcriptional repressor. It is all four of those boxes, right? It both activates and represses. And so the exact same molecule, depending upon whether it binds upstream, enhances RNA polymerase, or it binds at the operator, Blocks transcription. Thank you. Same molecule. So R is able to bind in different genes in different places. So let's look at this. What's happening here? So cool. Well, we better write down what I just said. So we've got this regulon. I'm still talking about prior practice. We're still in number two. Has a regulon called Sir R. And Sir R. So this is a protein because I got this capitalized here, is what we would call a master regulator, okay? And let me tell you, in this field, everybody wants to discover the master regulator, like the one that's the overarching, because all these other things are just fine-tuned, right? But if you can find the master regulator, then suddenly you feel like your life's work is worthwhile, I guess. Okay, so we got this master regulator. And it switches, this master regulator switches gene systems from fermentation to anaerobic respiration. And I already told you that it, um, and can function both as an activator and as a repressor, okay? Repressor. And I'll stop writing in cursive, no apologies. You guys read it okay? Switches gene systems, systems from fermentation to anaerobic respiration and can function both as an activator and as a repressor, depending upon where it binds. So this thing uh, regulates 17 different promoters. But wait, she said 53. How does that work? It regulates 17 different promoters and 50 
three open reading frames. How can it do that? How can we have 70 promoters but 53 genes? How is that? Tell the person next to you. How can how how can that be? Regulate 17 different promoters. Oh, that's me. Did you say the word operon? Because that's what I heard, and you're correct, right? We got several genes up downstream of some of these promoters. That's the only way that could be. So it functions at 17 different promoters across the chromosome of this archaea, and it does that. Um, in doing so, several of them are operons so that they have multiple genes downstream of that promoter. Okay, so that's how you get more genes. You following me? Okay, you knew it, you knew it. Just maybe weren't there yet. Many of you were. Okay, so we said that this organism can ferment, and it can also take elemental sulfur and uh, break it down using anaerobic respiration, making hydrogen sulfide, yeah. Um, can you feel like a master regulator? Is there one that it prefers to do, or is it just depending on its environment? What would this organism prefer to do? I presume, I don't have my micro, but so, which do you like to do? <laughs> um, but if I were a bacteria, I would like the one that's gonna give me the most energy <coughs> so I can do everything I want. So which one's gonna give me the most energy? Anaerobic respiration. So I would think that that's what I would wanna do, but I don't know what each one would like to do. But I would presume that's what it would prefer to do, yeah. Open reading frame. Open reading frame. Open reading frame. Okay, so let's draw our little map. So if there is no sulfur, this is our, our scenario, no sulfur, no sulfur, or pyrococcus, it's furious about that. All right, so here's our Sir R, the master regulator. Sir R here, we're gonna draw a little circle around it, is an activator that's going to positively turn on what? What does it need to turn on if there's no sulfur present? No sulfur. Is it gonna use the genes for this? No. no. So we're gonna turn on fermentation. So where do we need to bind if we're an activator? Upstream, Upstream of the promoter. Okay, there's a promoter operator and we've got genes A, B, C, D, E, F, G, blah, blah, multiple genes, okay? And these, it turns out there are three, three different operons and they code for hydrogenases. Okay? And so you, then you get mRNA because you've got the activator binding, MR, um, your, your uh, polymerase is gonna bind. Now that you have an activator bound, your R is happily there, and you get fermentation, okay? So we don't have any Sir R, but we also said that you're gonna turn off these genes because you don't have any um, sulfur present. So at the same time, this molecule is going to bind, and it is a repressor to other sets of genes. And so where's that repressor gonna bind? Upstream or downstream? Downstream. Gonna bind the operator region. Let's write that in, promoter, operator. It's gonna bind the operator region. Okay, and it's gonna block RNA polymerase from going downstream. It'll bind to the promoter, but it's stuck because Sir R is in the way, like that big old truck that's blocking your way down the one lane highway. Okay, it's blocking it. So here you get um, uh, no expression of these sulfur metabolism genes. Okay, so no sulfur metabolism genes. How you like that gene name? Good, you don't have to remember it. So what happens, you don't get any mRNA and you don't get any anaerobic respiration. Pretty clever, huh? Ta -da. All right, if sulfur is present, 
turns out Sir R has a couple cysteine residues. Those of you who take biochemistry know about cysteine, one of our amino acids. What does cysteine have? Cysteine so has diol groups which bind to each other to form cystones. Yeah, so you get these disulfide bonds, okay? So cysteine has, uh, uses sulfur and to make cysteine. So anyway, Sir R, is, if sulfur is present, the structure of it changes, actually, and it changes in such a way that it can't bind anymore. So Sir R, we talked about in the large, the major groups of the DNA is where a lot of these regulators bind. So you have a consensus, a Sir R binding site upstream and downstream of a promoter. When it binds here, it activates, and it binds here, it represses. When sulfur is present, this is no sulfur, when sulfur is present, it actually changes the structure of Sir R and it can't bind anymore. So this is no longer bound, and this is no longer bound. What's gonna happen? It doesn't bind here, RNA polymerase might find it, but it's not a very good promoter. So it may, it'll be on maybe at a low level, hydrogenase genes at a low level. And Saray doesn't bind here anymore, you don't have that big truck blocking your one lane highway. And so RNA polymerase is on its way, making all of the uh, sulfur metabolism genes so you undergo anaerobic respiration. Pretty nifty, huh? Yeah. I'm sorry? So all of this is like, remember it's not a light switch. So sulfur, enough sulfur is present, then that might change the structure of the Sir R a little bit, and maybe you might still get some binding, but not total binding when you've got lots of sulfur present. Sir R has completely changed up its structure, and it's not binding to inhibit sulfur metabolism genes anymore, right? You can. Sure, and you could imagine how that might be. So the question was, is it possible that you could have both, all the sets of genes going? And you could imagine that might be the case if you had a little bit of sulfur present so some of the SIR Rs are, are affected and others are not affected and so, yeah. So then you would have low level expression of both. That would make sense to me. I don't know the answer, but I would say that makes sense that you would. We can read this paper and see, they looked at that, yeah. So just to clarify, when there's no sulfur, SIR R is an activator that binds up to the motor and then it expresses. Why don't you? Tell each other. Okay. Yeah, right now. Go ahead, tell each other. Explain this. What happens when you have sulfur? What happens when you don't have sulfur? Double check each other.
Okay, the one thing we didn't write down is if there is sulfur in the presence of sulfur. Did you write, did you go over that? In the presence of sulfur, what happens? In the presence of sulfur? Then it just does the opposite by releasing. Yeah, and why? The Sir R, right? Sir R structure changes and can no longer bind. Okay, and then you can go over what would happen if it doesn't bind. Then you don't get activation and you don't get repression, okay? In the presence of sulfur, the structure of Sir R is gonna change, that's a capital S. Okay, and it can no longer <coughs> bind to the DNA at its consensus sequence change. Yeah. So since it's a master regulator, it can act as either or? Yeah, this master regulator can be both an activator and a repressor. Mm -hmm. And we have another example coming, number three, four. Four, number four coming up, yes. Yeah. So is, is it an activator and a repressor simultaneously? Like yes, can, at oh. the exact same time. Amazing, right? Yes. So is it, I guess, because it, the anaerobic respiration makes it the most so is it kind of like, it's not really wasting it, because as soon as it's wasting or like expunging energy, like getting it at the same time? So the question is, the fact that you get a lot more ATP, it's willing uh, in the absence of sulfur, in the presence of sulfur, then it's willing to go ahead and run this because it has, it has a substrate upon which it's gonna utilize for anaerobic respiration. Yeah, okay. You ready for the next one? Cool stuff, huh? Yeah. Uh, if you put selenium in this, would it still work? I don't know. Can I put you in touch with these guys? That's a great question. Here's the paper. You want to go to Georgia? Athens is a nice place. Actually, Regensburg, Germany, Larry and I were talking. Okay, right. That's a good question, and I think it's a question for the research scientists that are doing this. Yeah. Okay. Cool stuff. Okay. Let's talk now about um, an operon and regulator regulatory system that was first identified in E. coli and then found to be present in Salmonella. <gasps> Both of my favorite ones. So, um, if you take the paper, we're ready for it, thank you. Um, so, this is a system called, so we're done with pyrococcus, okay? We're moving on to number four example. So now I'm gonna talk about something called the two component regulators, <coughs> okay? which can be regulons, but they could be all on to themselves as well, okay? Two component regulators can be a part of a regulon or not. Okay, so it's a little bit of a, of a con concept, a brand new concept, as well as fitting under regulon. So that's where, but it's, it fits to put to start talking about it here. Okay, so let's tell you about uh, two component regulators. Two component regulators is a, a mechanism found in bacteria only. We have not found this in archaea yet, and I love this so far. Okay, they've only found this in archaea, uh, in bacteria, not in archaea yet. So um, these organisms use this, they use a two component system to sense and respond to the environment. Now you could argue that the um, Sir R is sensing and responding to its environment, right? It's recognizing the presence of sulfur, but in a way that that sulfur is altering the structure of the Sir R. These literally sense 
uh, by having a molecule, a histidine kinase, sitting in the cytoplasmic membrane, so it loops out of the cell, out of the cytoplasmic membrane into the periplasmic space, through, the per through that cytoplasmic membrane, and down into the cytoplasm. Okay, so it spans that cytoplasmic membrane. And it senses what's coming into that periplasmic space in a gram-negative bacteria. Okay, so it senses this, and that histidine kinase molecule that's sitting in that cytoplasmic membrane, so remembering back, way back to the beginning of chapter two when we showed you the structure of the cytoplasmic membrane, and we said one of the roles is that it holds these proteins. Well, one of the proteins could be the sensor kinase of a two-component regulator, okay? So this thing is sitting in the membrane, and I mentioned that it's a histidine kinase, which means that it phosphorylates things at the histidine residue. So it takes ATP, cleaves it to ADP, and puts that phosphate on something. One of the things it puts itself on is itself, so it's an autophosphorylator. The other thing it puts it on is the response regulator. So the two components are a histidine kinase and a response regulator. So where's that histidine kinase found? In the cytoplasmic membrane, okay, and senses the environment. has ATPase activity, and it takes, cleaves ATP to ADP and inorganic phosphate. That inorganic phosphate then goes on as a kinase. It goes on to the response regulator, which is the other component, component A, component B. We're gonna mark what those are, two components. Okay, and it's so regulator, missing an A in there, regulator. Okay, so we have a histidine kinase sitting in the cytoplasmic membrane that senses the environment and cleaves ATP to ADP and phosphate, it takes that phosphate and it puts it on the response regulator and also back on itself. Okay, so that's autophosphorylation. All right, so rather than looking at my, I ran out that way too, phosphorylation. Rather than looking at my notes, let's take a look at the picture, you ready? In your book. So the example here is Ampar and Z. And Z, where do you think end, end is found? The two players are Ampar and N Z. Which do you think is which by the names? Any ideas? An envelope protein, maybe? Okay, so our example that I'm going to give you is MZ and UMP R. UMP R is the response regulator. That's the response regulator. Okay, it's the second component. Okay, so here we go. Look at that, two component regulatory systems. I'm you glad you read your chapter. I know, we're going like all these things. First lab, don't, what did one of my students say? Don't pay Peter, don't pay Peter to pay Paul. Anyway, you gotta be careful. Doing only lab, oh, we got lecture stuff too. And totally been able to straddle both. But in this case, we got, um, I gotta move it down so, you know, got that height thing So we got our environmental signal. Which membrane is this? Oh yeah, there it is, the plus membrane. Okay, so we got a sensor kinase that's spanning this lipid bilayer. It sits there, this is where it's located, okay? The bacteria make it, chaperones bring it, and stick it in there, all right? So it's synthesized, the structural molecule sits right in there. And it's sensing, so if this is a gram-negative bacteria, what's this area here? It's the periplasmic space. We got another lipid bilayer up here, right? The outer membrane. So this is sitting in the cytoplasmic membrane. The environmental signal has come through, come through through a variety of mechanisms, that outer membrane, 
and it's going to bind to our sensor kinase. When that happens, this is a histidine kinase. ATP gets cleaved to ADP, and you get a phosphate on the histidine residue of this cytoplasmic membrane bound molecule. Okay? At the same time, this can put a phosphate on a histidine of another molecule, and that's our response regulator. So here's our response regulator. So it's going this way. It takes that phosphate and lobs it onto our response regulator. Now this phosphate bound response regulator has changed its structure and charge just a little bit, but now it can bind somewhere either in the operator region or maybe as an activator upstream of the promoter, okay? In this picture, it's binding to the operator and it's blocking transcription so the RNA polymerase can't move down and make un-RNA off that DNA, okay? Now, if this response regulator that's phosphorylated by the sensor kinase binds to multiple genes, not just this one, then we call that a I think we have seen this in some of the mm -hmm. The example I'm going to give you is E. coli and salmonella that are negative. Yeah. But yes, it's gram positives. Yes. Yeah, so the histidine kinase will only get phosphorylated if it senses the signal. And that signal can be anything. It can be a specific salt. It could be divalent cations. It could be um, a specific molecule, not just salts in general. Um, I'm going through all the lists of things. In the case of the Ampar and Z, it's sensing osmolarity. Okay, osmolarity. So bacteria such as E. coli can live in the pond as well as in our gut. When it's in the pond, what level of osmolarity? Is it high or low in the pond? Out in the waterway. Is that a lot of salt in that American River? No. How about in our intestines? A lot of salt? What salt is present there? Bile salts. Bring in that lab into the lecture. Good job. Okay, we got bile salts, certainly. Sodium desoxycholate is bile salt. Sodium, okay? So we got high salt in our intestines, low salt in the environment. So if this is a bacteria that's got to get its game on, we are inside of an intestine here. We got to turn some stuff on here. Or now it's in the pond, and there's something that maybe you haven't realized, but that waterway, not a whole lot of nutrients in there, okay? So in your intestines, did you just eat something? Yeah, you got some nutrient, maybe not, maybe you should, and then you won't fall asleep. Or maybe that would make you fall asleep, it just depends, like, oh, kind of thing. Okay, so in our intestines, we actually have a lot of nutrients. In the waterway, not so much. So if you have a porin, again, really, with chapter two, I thought we were done. If you have a porin, which is gonna allow molecules into the cell, would you wanna have big holes if you're in the pond or little holes if you're in the pond? <laughs> Tell the person next to you. You're in a waterway. Do you want big holes or little holes for your porin? Tell them. Tell them. Yeah. Easier to
to bind this RR, response regulator with the phosphate is now going to bind to the DNA and function as a regulator. And we said that if it binds to multiple genes, it's now a regulon. And we said that it can function as both an activator and a repressor. Depends on the system. And just like SIR R, it can do both. It can activate some genes and repress other genes at the same time, depending upon where it's binding. Okay? And we're going to definitely see that example now. So here's our example. Omp R, and this is a, a product, so it's a capital O. Omp R and end Z. And V is in the envelope. Okay, so that's the cytoplasmic membrane part, and this is our response regulator part. Okay? And this is, uh, was first identified by a guy at Princeton in E. coli. Okay, Tom Silhavi. So he found this in E. coli. Subsequently, we found it in Salmonella. And then in my postdoctoral work, I discovered that it was involved in salmonella causing disease. So that was pretty cool. Because you never know what you're going to find. And I found a bar MZ, a system that had already been characterized. And I was like, hey, here, my job is done. Okay, so Ampar MZ. So Ampar MZ, as Tom Sohavi discovered, and the folks in his lab, regulate two porins, the OMP F and the OMP C. So I'm introducing to you the players of this story. Again, so we have two porins, OMP C and OMP F. That stand for outer membrane protein. Cool, huh? So these are porins in the outer membrane. And we say that OMP C has a small porin, small holes, small pore, we'll say pore and OMP F has large pores. Remember, it's a tetramer. Okay, now just for fun, I'm gonna tell you that the small pore is 1.08 nanometers, and the large pore, I know you, you poured plenty of effort into trying to figure out which was gonna be open, but get this, the large pore is 1.12 nanometers. <laughs> Okay, so again, we're just fine tuning, fine tuning. Okay, so large and small is relative, it's just a little bit bigger. Okay, <laughs> you know, like, seriously? Okay, so in the colon, we said we're going to have the small pore open and the large pore closed. Again, it's not really a light switch, it's fine tuning. And then in the pond, we're going to have a large pore open and the small pore closed. Okay? All right. So OMP F is on in the pond for scavenging as much as it can. So now let's do this. Low osmolarity. Ready for the scenario? Low osmolarity. So where are we for low osmolarity? When the colon or in the pond? We're in the colon. No, we're in the pond. The colon has sodium disoxycholate. <laughs> you got me. Okay, so low osmolarity is now we're in the pond, okay? So NZ is going to have 
low kinase activity. Remember, this is a phosphokinase. In other words, it takes phosphate group and puts it onto a histidine residue. So it's not going to do this at a very high level in low osmolarity. So it has low kinase activity. And interestingly, it actually also is a phosphatase, just to make it more interesting. So not only does it not put the phosphate on, it takes phosphates off. It doesn't put them on, it takes them off, so it's like no phosphate, none in both directions, right? It's not putting them on, and it's actually taking them off if it is on, okay? <laughs> All right, so we'll write it out and then we'll look, okay? So what happens here, we have ampar phosphate, is that in high or low amount? Low amount, right? Because it's not putting phosphates on and it's actually taking phosphates off. So it's in low amount, okay? And if um, something I haven't told you yet, when I introduce the players, is these are coded by genes, and both of these genes have ampar phosphate recognition sequence, uh, consensus sequences for it to bind. That makes sense, right? But what's interesting is just like the RNA polymerase, how it likes to bind a really good consensus sequence, and it doesn't like to bind so much the other ones, we have what are called high affinity binding and low affinity binding. So high affinity binding is gonna bind up the ampar phosphate first. If it has low affinity binding, and you only have a little bit of ampar phosphate, it's not going to go there because of very low affinity, okay? But if the system is saturated with ampar phosphate, it's going to bind to all of the sites, right? Both low and high affinity sites. All right. Did I tell you you got to come with your brain turned on today? <laughs> You're, we're almost there. Okay. So ampar phosphate is in low amount, okay? And so it will bind only to... Which, which kind of affinity? Low high, high affinity. It won't bind to low affinity because there's not enough of it. Okay, there's only a little bit. So it's only gonna bind to the high affinity sites because there's not enough, it's not a saturated system. So it's only binding to the high affinity sites. So let's go ahead and draw what we're talking about here. So let's draw our genes. Here is our omp F, omp F gene. And we're going to put a promoter in here. Make sure you got room on both sides of your promoter. Okay. And then we're going to draw OMP C. And these are genes, so we have a lowercase o there, right? You know that from your Bio 184 class. Here's our promoter. Okay, and here's our key over here. The diamond is high affinity and a circle is going to be our low affinity. Okay, high affinity binding and low affinity binding. So OMP F, as it turns out, has a high affinity binding upstream. So is that activator or repressor action there? Activator. And it has a low affinity binding downstream. So is that activator site or a repressor site? Repressor. repressor site. Cool. And then we've got three low affinity binding sites to OMPSI. So now, rather than me telling you the story, you take this information and you tell the story to the person next to you. What happens in low osmolarity? We have ampar phosphate in a low amount and it's only going to bind to the high affinity sites. So tell the person next to you what's going on there. In low osmolarity, no. who is going to be on? And then you can check it with our chart above. You can come on A. Of course you're not. <laughs> <laughs> Dang. Yeah. So Dude, that homework sucked so bad. It was so long. Did you do Newton too? You can't find any of the answers. Yeah. 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 Yeah
answers online. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I'm yeah. trying to get through it. I know. This is taking like twice as long to do. Oh, yeah. I think this is only supposed to take like four questions. Dang. Are you too tired? Do you want me to do it? Yes. Yep. Yes. Alright. You ready? You got this. Alright. Low osmolarity on Z. So much. Is not making much on bar phosphate. It's not putting phosphate on, on a bar. So we don't have a whole lot of this. So the only place this is going to bind is where it's got high affinity. There's not enough in the cell to bind in, the, in these other sites. So we're in low osmolarity. We don't have many um, bar phosphates. So where is it binding? Only to the triangles. So where is it binding? Upstream, which is an activator. We get lots of amp F. Is that correct? Let's double check. Lots of amp F large pour on in the pond, which is low osmolarity. <gasps> cool, okay, what happens in high osmolarity? In high osmolarity, we're gonna have MZ sensing this osmolarity, mm -hmm. lots of off our phosphate, right? We got lots of phosphatase activity, I mean, uh, kinase that activity, kind of makes lots of kinase sense. activity, lots of off our phosphate, so is it gonna bind here to the high affinity? Yeah, there's lots of on par phosphate. It's gonna bind everywhere. It's gonna bind here, it's gonna bind here, it's gonna bind here, here, and here. On par phosphate's binding everywhere because there's lots in there, okay? If it binds three places upstream of OMP C, will OMP C be made? Yeah. Lots of activation, lots of RNA polymerases coming in, it's landing in, okay? Lots of OMP-C being made, okay? OMP-C is our small pore, and so we're in the colon and high osmolarity. So it's closing, it's, it's got uh, the small pore. What's happening with our large pore, okay? So it's allowing things in, but not everything, the small pore. Our large pore has ampar phosphate binding here and ampar phosphate binding here. So the RNA polymerase is recruited in and it's on its way down the promoter and what happens? It hits a semi truck on the way down the one lane highway. It stopped. It found. Can't go anywhere. So do you get amp F? Isn't that cool? Okay. So your book actually has the Ampar MZ system ex uh, explained. Check it out. There they are. So if you're a pictorial person, you can see the whole thing together with Amp F being really big, Amp C being little, high osmolarity, low osmolarity, our LPS sitting out here, MZ in the cytoplasmic membrane. Lots of up our phosphate and what's happening. Okay? So you can put figure 7.18 uh, to check out that explains on bar phosphate and on C and on F sort. Okay? Cool. There are other two component regulator systems. One of them is the NAR system, which regulates the use of nitrate versus nitrate, and this is our membrane, okay? And this is utilization of the different um, nitrate here. And you can see this actually crosstalks. So you have two different sensors. Crazy, right? Two different sensors. It senses the uh, presence of nitrate that phosphorylate this system and this one phosphorylates that system and they phosphorylate each other. That's crazy, I'm not gonna tell you much more about it. And then we have another system, which is the ARC system, okay? ARC B, which has to do with aerobic metabolism. So I wanna show you how powerful this ARC B system is, are you ready? Okay, 
Okay. So this is our two component regulator. This is the FNR system that I already told you about. So FNR, or no, I was telling you about the NAR genes. Well, it turns out FNR, you ready? FNR, this one actually regulates these. Regulates these genes. So you have a two component regulator that cross talks. And then we have FNR, which regulates the genes that are going to go into the cytoplasmic membrane. And then we have it also regulating the ARC-A gene, and this is a two-component system. What does the ARC-A gene do? It turns a cell from going aerobic to going anaerobic. So here you have ARC-A. When ARC-A is on, it's inhibiting all of these genes. Okay. What is what are those genes? Arc A, MDH, oxaloacetate. FUMA is the enzyme going to malate from fumarate to malate. So what are these genes? What is this? This is glycolysis. This is the Krebs cycle. All of the genes for all of the enzymes involved in the Krebs cycle are regulated by the ARC A, ARC B system. Crazy, huh? So, this is a re the real deal, okay? So, regulation is really integral to how bacteria function. It turns them to being anaerobic versus aerobic versus fermentation versus being able to survive inside of an epithelial cell or not. Okay, um, other, other sensors are temperature, um, Yersinia pestis, which is uh, transmitted by a flea, senses, so it causes the plague, senses temperature, it knows the temperature of the flea versus the temperature of your body, and it turns genes on that are required to be and live inside of a flea, and when it gets into your body, it turns all those genes off and only the genes that it needs to be inside your body on. And this is huge. So regulation is a big deal. And you guys are um, ready and your brain is stone without any uh, drugs, just microbiology. So that's where we'll leave it. And then when we come back after our exam on Monday, we're going to talk about quorum sensing and about biofilms. Okay? Continuing on with cool stuff. We'll see you tomorrow. If you haven't connected with your groups for lab, please do so.